time to um, resume from recess. It is 1.58, and we are going to continue with agenda item number six, the review and approval of the June uh, 2018 meeting minutes. Okay, so on page nine of the meeting materials, you'll go ahead and find the June uh, 2018 meeting minutes. I'll go ahead and go through uh, by each page, and you can let me know if you have any edits or questions. Anything for page one. Page two. Um, just a comment that um, came to me on reviewing the minutes. When we, when a board member reads the minutes or reads the um, the mission statement, um, I would like to request that the mission statement actually be printed rather than just with that. Um, or potentially even putting the, the mission statement at, at near the header. Yeah. But I, if we're going to continue to do it this way with to include it in the minutes, I would rather I would like to see the mission statement itself printed there. Um, just to help solidify what it is. Correction for page number two. Line number sixty-seven. It reads uh, March twenty second and twenty third, twenty seventeen. I believe it's twenty eighteen. <coughs> Page six. Page seven. Page eight. Page nine. Yes. Page nine. Sorry, I'm looking for where we have uh, the CPTA report. I'm sorry, that wasn't it. That would be page 11. You can keep going. Um, page 10. Page 11. Yeah. So page, maybe it's not page 11. Page 12. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> page 12. Yeah, there, um, Line 449 under CPTA, maybe just sticking in there that the CPTA annual conference is out of state. That will be for 2019 as well. Also on line 463, it says that the board reconvened into open session and adjourned. I believe that's a recess because that's still day one. That's day one, is it? I think that's day. Is it? Is it day two? Okay. That's day two. Oh, I think that's day two. Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. So, a suggestion to help clarify that would be just if it's adjourning on day two or the date mm -hmm. that those particular, so that because we do take things out of order sometimes mm -hmm. just to clarify instead of just having the time, but mm -hmm. put the date. Thank you, Dr. Trevor. That's a good suggestion. You can call me Dr. Trevor. Okay, page 13. Page 14. Let's see. Um, with each of these motions, which were about removing approval agency status, um, for consistency, if the language of the motions could be the same. 
rather than having slight editorials, uh, editorial differences. Um, for example, um, uh, line 554, 553, 554, to remove encompass from the approved vendor list, which is, we were removing them as an approval agency. Um, so for consistency there, um, I think it would be better if we can, if the motions were all addressing the same kind of action, to have that, have that be in place. I think with regards to that being a, recommendation for the minute taker that's more of an issue to address when the motions are being made mm -hmm. because the note taker's responsibility isn't to you know change what the motions were the minute taker's responsibility is only to record them as they were said so to the extent the board wants uniformity that's something that i think can be addressed when the motions are being made so i understand that but for editorial um consistency there would be no problem with with having the language be consistent. Um, that's often a liberty that's often taken when uh, minutes are being um, developed to, for editorial consistency to have that be reflected. Do motions have to be verbatim though? My recommendation is that the minute taker take down the motions as they are. You run the risk of um, changing the meaning or intent of a motion when the, when the minute taker is taking the liberty to change them to what they think maybe sounds better or looks better, but perhaps the board member who made the motion intended it to, to be a certain way or the board members understood it a certain way, so the recommendation is that they be taken down as they were said and that to deal with the uniformity issue at the meeting. But in this case, it's all just to take the... Um, the agency off the list, right? I mean, there's no change. And I, and I think it's certainly appropriate for that change to be a result of conversation that happens here today in reviewing of those minutes. Okay. So then I would move that all of these motions which deal with removing um, these agencies as approving agencies, that the motion language be consistent across all of them. Motion. <laughs> I don't think you could tell me the second though. <laughs> so now I can. If you don't want to, you go. Doesn't look good, Danny. Sorry. I can second. <laughs> okay, so motion to have the language consistent for um, all of the the said items to remove approval agencies. Item 21 from the June minutes. And is there any further board discussion? Just a question for clarification. The, the uniform language that you would like to see um, would be to remove recognition from the, and then the name of the, the agency that it's representing as a continuing competency recognized approval agency. Yes. Okay. It, for example, on uh, page 14, line 566, the motion was to remove evidence in motion. So maybe Dr. Drummer suggests we tighten the language up a little bit. <laughs> Do we have any public comment? Okay, no further discussion from the board. And a roll call vote. Alicia Benina. Aye. T.J. Watkins. Aye. Oh, uh, Jesus Dominguez. Aye. Daniel Drummer. Aye. Katarina Ellaby. Aye. Tanya McMillian. Um, no. No. I found another um, something to be corrected on page 17. Um, not we're not approving the minutes. Oh, we're not. No. Well, when did we move to that? Um. Okay. Aye. <laughs> the motion was made to make the language uniform yeah. Yes, on all of the items under agenda item 21 for the June minutes uh, regarding removing approval agencies from okay. our list. I just didn't know when we moved. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Is it agenda item 6? It's agenda item 6. Oh, agenda, uh, forgive me, agenda item 6. <clears throat> 
points, 6 0, motion carries. Okay. okay, so that was page 14. Um, page 15. Page 16. Um, on line 650, there was a punctuation after meeting. Should be a semicolon. September board meeting, you see it? My apologies. We are currently on agenda item six of this meeting's agenda. Correct. The issue that we were looking, that the motion sought to change was item 21 from right. the May, or from the June mm -hmm. Correct. Mi minutes. Thank you. Thank you. So on the bottom of page 16 under the Consumer Protection Services Report, I, this may belong there. I'm just asking for clarification. Um, Mr. Kaiser directed the members to the probation monitoring report, but that actually was under item 24, which is the next one. So I'm wondering if that sentence in 655 should say the Consumer Protection Services Report. Mm, can, yeah. Does anyone see what I'm looking at yeah. there? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any other edits on page 16? Page 17. Line 665. Standard number four, which look at, which looks at. Bodily fluid testing. Mm hmm take, take out which look at the first one. And it should be a period, I think, after testing. And line 677, uh, should legal be capitalized? Yeah, either that or change the, the word. Yeah. Or add a word. <clears throat> Jason, do you see what she's looking at? 677, line 677 on uh, agenda book, page 25. Um, add, a, add a word, counsel. Once that um, out, that once legal counsel approves the adopted rulemaking language. Okay. Okay. Anyone want to make a motion to approve the minutes as amended? So moved. I second. Um, oh, sorry. Public comment. Oh, shame, shame. Just real quick back at page 17. Back at the 665. EO determined if? Yeah, I think it, it, I think it's determined. Yeah. So as Mr. Kaiser stated, the executive officers will be looking at standard four, which looks at bodily fluid testing. And EO determined if existing rule is appropriate. EO should be and. EO. And determine if existing rule is appropriate or if advances in technology and available services need to be changed. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so should I move that we now um, adopt?
adopt the minutes, the June minutes as amended. And I now second your motion, and now we have public comment. Any further board discussion? Okay, we'll call vote. Alicia Benina. Aye. T.J. Watkins. Aye. Jesus Dominguez. Aye. Daniel Drummer. Aye. Katarina Ellaby. Aye. Tanya McMillian. Aye. Six to zero, motion carries. Agenda item seven, uh, review and approval of the September 2018 minute, uh, meeting minutes. Okay, so those are beginning on page 26 of the meeting materials. Anything on page one? Page two. Page three. I have a question at the bottom of the page on agenda item number six. Um, Dr. R RA stated that the board asked for the increase in the exempt level of the executive officer be placed on the agenda each year to revisit. Was it each year or was it each meeting? Was it each year? It was year, annual? I believe it was annual. Oh, okay, that was my question. So um, I had a comment. I reviewed these, you know, ahead of times, and one of my suggestions was that, uh, for consistency purposes and for other reasons, I'll describe that the executive officer's report should identify each subsection of that report that was identified in the agenda. So the agenda book had identified subsections. I think it was A through. Um, all the way going through G, but the draft minutes only show subsection A um, here in this draft I'm looking at. I'm not sure in the first draft that it had any of the subsections identified. Um, the purpose of that is, you know, for the rest of the minutes, you know, we're identifying each agenda item and the subsections, whether it was addressed, what was addressed. Um, sometimes agenda items are skipped. Um, and so the minutes should reflect that as well, that there wasn't discussion, but to not address the subsection of the agenda item, it's unclear whether or not it was addressed, if it was skipped, um, whether there was public comment. Um, so that's a change I'd re recommend here for agenda item five, and then as a global edit. So do you have any suggestions on how we can make that better, um, Jason, as far as being reflected in the minutes, or is it something we want to change as far as the presentation on the agenda? I mean. Or we can say during your report for each of those sections, you can say see that section's report, which is what you did say, but we just mm -hmm. don't put it in the minutes. Yeah, for for record keeping sake and for the purposes of the review of these minutes, I'm fine. I'll just have to kind of, you know, look at that the way I draft the EO report moving forward and maybe that's the, the cleaner way of taking it out, right? So um, I usually know about two weeks before a meeting what the EO report is going to contain mm -hmm. as far as highlights, things that may not fit in certain categories. Um, and so in that case where I had posted it as part of the agenda as kind of a placeholder, um, I might be able to be a little bit more accurate in my estimate into what's going to be discussed under the EO report or not, so we would have fewer subsections. But for the purposes here, that's fine. And so then if you did that in the future, of course, um, whenever the other reports came up later in that particular meeting, you chime in. It could be discussed. Yeah, okay. Okay, um, where are we? Okay, moving on. Any other um, edits on page two? Page three. Page four. 
line beginning on uh, a sentence beginning on line 118. Mr. Kaiser responded that there are two issues. The board is growing in ratio. I believe we meant to put is not growing in ratio to the licensing population. Page five. On line 149, I think executive officer should be capitalized. Page 14. Page 15. Page 16. Page 17. Page 18. In the paragraph beginning with line 720, um, I'm actually wanting to put some sort of a qualifier probably near the end of that paragraph that would um, state the presentation, I mean, just the concept of the, of the paragraph, the presentation was on dry needling, but I would like to add as performed in their VA clinic, just to provide clarity that they are not providing um, dry needling in an area that is under the jurisdiction of this board. Okay. Thank you. And then on line 727, yeah. um, which is addressing Ms. Lau's um, statements, um, on line 27, uh, pre the presentation on dry needling, however, stated her belief that dry needling is not practiced in California under Acupuncture Practice Act. Um, because that was her statement of her belief and not her statement of fact. And there should be a semicolon after needling on 727 and a comma after however. <laughs> Page 19. On line 735 all the way to 737, it's a little confusing that we entered closed session on day two at 630, and then we adjourned at 504. It's like we went into a time machine and... I think those <laughs> times are swapped, aren't yeah. they? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. 
<laughs> I know we're good, but we're not that good. Yes. Yeah. Also, line 763. Um, Teresa Gutierrez, responsible for processing non-accredited PT and PT applicants <clears throat> applications, maybe PT and PT A applications from non-accredited programs. <laughs> for agenda item 19, um, A subsection A and B, the, the timing of the closed session overlap. Um, so one is from 4.30 to 6.30, the other one's from 5.04 to 6.30. Did, was that supposed to be 4.30 to 5.04 and then the other one from 5.04 to 6.30? I think so. I think so, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Any other edits on page 19? Page 20. And line 796, um, should it say have seen a decrease or it doesn't, Ms. Conley reported that duplicate license requests has seen a decrease due to help with the automation. Or I have decreased. decreased. Have decreased. Or have decreased, yeah. It's not, it's not. Any other edits on page 20? Page 21. Page 22. Okay. Any further board comment on the September meeting minutes? Um, I think we can entertain a motion. Do you want to take public comment first before we make a motion? Oh, yeah. Yes, public comment. <laughs> um, agenda item number 26, probation monitoring report mm -hmm. on page 21. Line, uh, I was talking about uh, probationers that entered the Maximus program, not so much the total number. How would you edit so that? Last year there were this year four licensees entered the program. Yeah. There's 11 total for the year, four for the first quarter yes. of this year. Any further public comment? Motion? So moved. We have a motion to approve the September 2018 meeting minutes as amended. We have a second. Second. TJ Watkins seconds. Further discussion by the board or from the public? And a roll call vote, please. Alicia Ben Amen. Aye. TJ Watkins. Aye. Jesus Dominguez. Aye. Daniel Drummer. Aye. Katarina Ellaby. Aye. Tony McMillian. Aye. Six to zero. Motion carried. Thank you, Brooke. There were many pages that did not have comments, which means you did a great job. <laughs> um, and then just a question for the board as a consensus as far as the detail that is included in the minutes, um, sufficient, too heavy, too light, uh, anything that you'd like to see moving forward in the future? For me, it felt pretty good. Mm -hmm. yeah. Perchance a little heavy because we do have the video recording to serve as verbatim minutes so that if there are questions uh, or concerns about how some things are done, they can, we can always review that to see exactly what the discussion was. So I actually would be in favor of 
a little less um, detail. Um, with regards to detail, some of the agenda items, you know, I think are more crucial in detail than others. Like, for example, the ones related to rulemaking packages. Um, we often rely on the minutes uh, um, as a reference when the staff are drafting the ISOR. So more detail on those are very helpful to us when we have to go back and review why the board did what they did, what options they considered, um, and why some options were taken and others weren't. Um, and it can be more difficult to go back and review the video for all of that detail as opposed to just having it in the minutes. It's also easier for the Office of Administrative Law because they're not gonna go back and watch the video. They're gonna look at the minutes um, as supporting material and that goes in the rulemaking package. So when I review it, I encourage more detail in those sections. Um, and then I agree if the board wants more or less detail, I think one of the important things, um, one of the key things are a consistency. Like the thing I pointed out about identifying some se sections but not others. Mm -hmm. um, it can be confusing for someone looking at it to wonder what happened with those other agenda items that aren't addressed. Mm -hmm. but, just a note. Still trying to find that balance with those minutes. Huh? <laughs> Looks all I'm doing what you're asking me to do. <laughs> okay, so we are going to move to agenda item number eight, President's Report and the 2019 proposed meeting calendar. So if we can all look at that calendar and look at our personal calendars. Any comments? Um, staff does have a few recommendations for the board to consider mm -hmm. for next year's calendar and then that moving forward into 2020. Mm -hmm. um, as you remember, we kind of um, played around with the idea of doing Thursday, Friday uh, meetings last year when we were in Sacramento. Mm -hmm. um, we ran into some difficulties when it came to uh, logistics, lodging, cost of travel, cost of flights on a Friday night as opposed to a Thursday night. Um, so the recommendation is to return back to just Wednesday, Thursdays, if the board so uh, wishes. Um, and the other recommendation for the 2019 calendar is to swap the physical locations for the month of September and December. So we would be out of town um, in June and September on the road, but back in Sacramento for the month of December and again for the month of, uh, the month of March. Any particular reason for that? Um, I think logistically, um, it lines up a little bit better with things like vacation timing and holidays, Thanksgiving, Christmas, but also um, our ability to get students in seats when we go to a campus. Um, December is a, a kind of a finals time and it makes it very difficult to go to a, a program and expect any kind of audience, but if we swap that out with September, mm -hmm. we have a greater likelihood of actually getting um, that outreach component to fill. I like that. In the past, uh, I believe staff requested that the fiscal year and meeting be home. Is that now being switched we're, for, we're to accommodate students? Yeah. Okay. Well, and when we were when we were recommending for the fiscal year, the month 13, of, but not the final fiscal year meeting, uh, we were also holding in August. And mm -hmm. so one of the difficulties was getting all that data in August to kind of close out. But since we've shifted it back to September, it's a little bit easier to okay. get that data now. Um, perhaps the two um, educators on the board can comment as to availability of students in June to be able to sit, to be able to attend a June meeting. Um, so for us, we're, we run year long, so we, we have students at uh, no finals typically. I think we can probably get more. My apologies. Uh, so we, we run, obviously, your year-round program. Uh, I would say that we have a higher uh, probability of getting students in June than in December, especially at this time in December. It's, looks like across the board we're, we're uh, dealing with finals. Mm -hmm. And um, here, having a meeting in June or September would be much better yeah. than March or December. And, and it looks like, as you can see from the calendar, we have a, a, a set time for next June with CSU on Long Beach, who's already committed to that. So um, 
and even with the reassurance that there will be students in seats, you know, while we're there. So then we're thinking maybe if um, it's Southern California in June that it might be Bay Area in September? Correct. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good to me. And other than um, the cost of travel for Thursday, Friday, was, was there any other big reason not to have it on Thursday, Friday? Um, logistically, availability. So the number of flights available versus the, the volume of people either coming or leaving that particular city. Um, and then the cost and availability of the hotel lodging also. Mm -hmm. so. Did anyone have trouble with that this year? Um, I don't think at, at the member level there was any issues. It was just the planning and kind of shuffling things around, trying to find a hotel that could accommodate that group at the same time. Hmm. The reason I'm asking is because I like Thursday, Friday. I liked it too. Oh, yeah? But, you know, there's staff to consider. Right We're now. flexible. Yeah. So, yeah. so the Thursday, Friday, I think even with the logistics and the cost of travel, that's acceptable. Um, because we have, you know, relationships established with certain hotel chains in Sacramento, we just be more proactive in our planning and put those things on the calendar. So again, it's up to the board. How do the other board members feel about Thursday, Friday versus Wednesday, Thursday? It, do you, are you strong either way? Strong feelings either way? You like the Thursday, Friday? Mm -hmm. and TJ, you're flexible. No, uh, Dr. Drummer? It's a lot easier for me to deal with the Thursday, Friday. Mm -hmm. Being in, being able to be in clinic in the in the hospital Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, rather than Monday, usually half day Tuesday, and then back on Friday. Yeah. It just it's a little more challenging that way. Yeah. So it sounds like board members are flexible, but if maybe staff gets accommodations and or flights out earlier, I don't know if that'll help, but we'll see. I guess we could try it. And you can let us know. I think it could. Yeah. Um, and again, with these, with those particular meetings, we're just talking about the Sacramento at home meetings being on Thursday and Friday, not the, the travel out of town. So. Mm -hmm. I, I just have a question. So it, uh, I'm already looking at it, my academic calendar. Mm -hmm. So would it be safe for me to assume that I should block off Wednesday through Friday, in case we do a Wednesday, Thursday, or Thursday, Friday? Does that make sense? I need to really book my calendar out a year in advance. Well, if I were you, I'd do that. <laughs> it seems like we're, we're still oscillating between Wednesday, Thursday, Thursday, Friday. Yeah. We're, we're flexible, but I would like to, I'm going to plan on blocking my calendar off for those three days and uh, mm -hmm. wait to hear. Mr. Kaiser? So, so when we're on the road, so, um, so for March, we would do 21st and 22nd, which is Thursday, Friday. And then for June, we would continue to do the 1920, which is a Wednesday, Thursday. Then the Bay Area in September would also be a Wednesday, Thursday. And then December of next year would be 12th, 13th in Sacramento, which is a Thursday, Friday. December 12th, 13th, you said. Thursday, Friday. Can you repeat those? Yeah. Sure. So March would be the 21st and 22nd, which is a Thursday, Friday. And that would be in Sacramento? Correct. And then June at CSU Long Beach on the 19th and 20th, which is a Wednesday, Thursday. And then September, which is to be determined Bay Area, 18th, 19th, which is a Wednesday, Thursday. And then December in Sacramento for the 12th and 13th which is a Thursday, Friday. Any other board comments on that 2019 calendar? Um, I'd like to know what happens at the APTA, the, the two meetings. 
the sections and the necks. Just a question. Of what what are those? They're on the counter just for informational purposes as far as the uh, PTBC's involvement in it. There isn't really any. Okay. So there are, are both CPTA and PTBC members, so we may have some board members in attendance for that. Mm -hmm. The January combined sections meeting is a predominantly educational um, meeting um, that happens. Um, it travels. Typically, it's in February. This year, it happens to be in um, in January, and it's going to be in DC. Um, the June meeting is the it's now called Next um, Next. It's traditionally been a more of a scientific presentation, but it's also educational, um, where the, the the combined sections meeting tends to be more clinical. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, and then um, I just checked because I hadn't seen that it was updated in the past uh, for primarily for Dr. Dominguez and I, but uh, orientation, board member orientation um, training is now posted for 2019. It wasn't posted as of, I believe, the weekend when I looked last. Um, Wednesday the 27th of March, Wednesday, June 19th, Wednesday, October 23rd. March or October. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Since we'll be since there's a meeting scheduled for 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 June. Any other board comment on the 2019 calendar? Any public comment on the 2019 calendar? And we don't need to take action, right? We're just going to kind of do it. Um, we do we not do? adopt the calendar at the last meeting. So mm -hmm. if with these changes, the board. Um, is happy with the calendar as set, we would, you know, like the motion to adopt the calendar okay. as set. Move to adopt the uh, proposed 19 calendar. Second. The motion by Dr. Drummer and a second by Ms. Ellaby to adopt the 2019 proposed meeting calendar as amended. And any further board discussion or public comment? And a roll call vote, please. Alicia Rabinia Nutt. Aye. T.J. Watkins. Aye. Jesus Dominguez. Aye. Daniel Drummer. Aye. Katarina Ellaby. Aye. Tanya McMillian. Aye. Six to zero. Motion carried. Thank you, Brooke. Let's move to the next agenda page and uh, agenda item 8B for the 2020 meeting calendar, just to take a peek at it and see if anyone had any comments on 2020 or Mr. Kaiser, if you have anything you want to say about 2020's meeting calendar. Um, I think with the discussion we had over 2019, we could just make those same kind of changes or edits to the months um, and Thursday, Fridays. Mm -hmm. And there's plenty of time to consider that, that calendar. So we'll make those, those changes that the board would like. Just one other comment um, with regard to the December, the new, the now December meetings. Um, if, for my sake, and I'm assuming for my fellow board members to try to get board materials, uh, meeting materials to us um, as early as possible um, in the month um, so that we have a adequate opportunity to review and, and prepare. Okay, any other board discussion on the 2020 calendar or public comment? Okay. All right, it looks like we are ready for agenda item number nine, executive officer's report. Um, so as you can see from the report, we're still um, recruiting for a vacancy for a very kind of crucial position at the board, and that is um, 
the office technician of the administrative services unit that acts as kind of the hub of communication at the front, sorts the mail, those kind of things. Right now, staff were um, absorbing those duties. Um, and we also um, tapped into a program that we've used in the past, um, ACC Senior Services. Um, and so we have a, um, a staff member from their services that's kind of helping us out. And so we wanted to kind of give her a shout out because she's been tremendously helpful. Um, and then the other um, topic in the EO report you'll see is our uh, relocation planning. Um, we are making incremental progress in planning and kind of evaluating our space needs and moving upstairs within the same building. Um, the numbers or the square footage numbers have been recalculated and then recalculated and then recalculated again. <laughs> Um, to kind of project for future growth and that kind of thing. So every time we've got a set of numbers, something either legislatively happens or um, budget change proposal-wise has happened. And so now we're going from uh, 4,400 square feet to about 8,500 square feet. So um, they started uh, doing demo upstairs this week. Oh tearing out all the old carpet and so it's 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 moving along quite nicely. So you know maybe this time next year we'll be in a new street. And then if you have any questions about any of the other things that are in the report I'd be happy to answer. What happens when your lease expires in March? We will, there will be a period of time where we will have to go kind of a month to month lease um, process and that's not um, well, it's not ideal. I don't think that there's any kind of uh, risks here to be concerned about. The landlord seems to be very um, amenable at trying to keep us as tenants. And so you know, all the requests that we've been making lately seem to have been addressed you know, efficiently, quickly, mm -hmm. um, good feedback. Um, so I don't think that's really an issue. But we will be month to month for a short period mm -hmm. of time. What's the mood of the staff anticipating the move? Um, <laughs> I get a lot of questions of when. Are we there yet? Are, yeah, are we there yet? So, <laughs> was that, what was it? It was hashtag moving in March. <laughs> um, but maybe not this March, next March. You know? So we'll see. But excited. Good. Thank you, staff, for working and getting things done in the small space that you have. I know you guys are all up against each other. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so those are your highlights. Those are the highlights. Okay. All right. Um, before we move on, yeah, strategic plan? Yeah, just one, the, the third one in the strategic planning. Um, the board, the board staff has um, already started work with SOLID's facilitators to create the action plan. Um, we had a, a two-day uh, meeting where we sat down and we took all the um, goals within the strategic plan and mapped them out and came up with timelines and that kind of thing. So um, very, uh, I. I had presented a strategic planning session at the Federation of State Boards, and one of the things they asked me about was the benefit of doing strategic planning. And there's a, um, a military strategy called burn the boats, and that is that you're so sure in your mission that when you get to the other side of the river, you burn the boats you came on so you can't go back. Mm -hmm. There is no, failure is not an option at that point. And I, that I had told them that I think that that is one of the advantages to strategic planning because you put out your expectations and now if you don't uphold those expectations, you have nobody to blame but yourself at that point. So um, when we were creating a timeline to measure our success for strategic planning, you can only imagine as we go through each goal and objective, what does that look like, okay? And how long will it take to get that done? And when do you want to start it? And when do you want to finish it? And most importantly, I think, who's responsible for that particular task? Mm -hmm. So it was a um, very um, educating uh, 
kind of exercise to go through. So there's a lot of work to do in the next couple of years. I want to thank you for placing that on your report. It's nice to see that we get an update on yeah. strategic planning. You'll, you'll thank you. To get them as we go through the action plan. Each person that I share the strategic, our strategic plan with at the FSPPT uh, annual meeting was wildly impressed and had several questions that I believe I deferred to you. I think one of the things that you might find interesting as a board is that nationwide, uh, the panel that I sat on was, you know, four states, and those are the only four states that actually do strategic planning out of the 53 jurisdictions. So it's kind of an alien concept to a lot of the jurisdictions that were there. All right. Any public comment on executive officer's report? Okay. Let's uh, move forward to agenda item number 10, discussion and possible board action for the increase in exempt level of the executive officer. And this um, we kind of glossed over on our minutes from the last meeting that we wanted this placed on the agenda um, once a year. And we also formed a committee um, and made a couple of motions to perhaps put together a letter. So any report from our committee? Well, TJ and I did meet and we drafted a letter. Um, we sent it to staff for them to provide their feedback. And then I believe they shared it with you, Alicia, is that correct? I haven't seen no? it. No? Okay. Yeah. Um, do we have copies of the letter available with the edits from staff? I can give them to you shortly. Okay. So to be continued then for board discussion, I suppose. Okay. Yeah. So let's table uh, agenda item number 10 for now and move on to agenda item number 11. Consumer Professional Associations and Intergovernmental Relations Reports. And we'll start with FSBPT. We don't have anyone um, present, but if there's anything anyone wanted to share regarding FSBPT, any news um, or anything we need to be aware of? There is a, um, a potential to do another regulatory training coming up in June. Um, we're still waiting to hear from them um, as far as how many members per jurisdiction or something like that. So as soon as we get that information, I'll be polling the members to see who has interest or who has even the, the availability to do it. Um, but other than that. Yeah, I think the last email I saw from them this week uh, regarding uh, regulatory training was asking for what times of the year would be opportune for certain jurisdictions. So it may still be in June, but it sounds like they're playing around trying to see if that might change as well. Yeah. So anything else regarding FSBPT? Um, the one thing I wanted to um, announce was that because the Foreign Educated Standards Committee did such great work in the past, um, Right now, it looks like there aren't any pressing issues to continue the committee, and so um, they have dissolved the committee, the Foreign Educated Standards Committee, and if there is anything that comes up, they'll form a task force. Okay, any um, public comment regarding FSVPT? Okay, and Department of Consumer Affairs? Um, I would expect them to be here in attendance tomorrow. To okay. Thank you. And agenda item 11C, CPTA. Good afternoon, I'm Stacey Defoe, Executive Director for um, California Physical Therapy Association, CPTA. And um, I'm just here, um, I just have a couple of things um, probably already know that um, in April we will be holding a um, student conclave um, here at UOP and we received um, word from staff that um, staff from um, the physical therapy board will be in attendance and covering one of the sessions um, for us so we're really excited about that and um, hopefully we'll see others of you there as well maybe drop by and say hi 
And then in, um, and I've seen this in numerous places, just a reminder that our annual conference um, this year is a joint conference. Um, it's going to take place in Las Vegas, and I know that there are some implications regarding travel, but um, we'd love to see, see you there, see the PT board represented if possible. So if there's anything we can do to help facilitate that, let us know. Um, and then I just a couple of updates on things that we've been looking at. Um, I, we all know um, the last time we were here, we talked about um, the direct access bill for um, children under IEPs and IFSPs. At that point, it was with the governor. Well, since then, it's been signed, so that um, is going into effect, and we're, we're really excited about that. And there was one other issue that I'm not sure if um, we've brought to your attention. It's kind of fallen under the radar. Um, but there was a situation um, where PTs and OTs who were providing contract services to um, NPAs and NPS um, were required, which are non-public agencies and non-public schools, um, were being required by the California Department of Education um, to submit to an audit. Um, it was something that the Department of Education had um, required sort of suddenly and it was um, causing hardship for a lot of the PTs and OTs providing those services because there wasn't a lot of clear language around what the audit would entail. And um, audits can be very expensive, sometimes more expensive than um, you know, what, what the PTs and OTs are getting from providing those services. So we um, worked with the California Department of Education last year and were able to get um, um, a clarification on that through the budget process that um, PTs and OTs providing those services will not be required to submit to an audit. So I'm not sure if that had come up before. Again, it flew a little bit under the radar, but it was um, a success that we had last year and something we were able to um, help out with. And then um, a couple of things we'll be looking at next year. Um, we know that um, we were pretty certain, we don't know for sure, but the athletic training um, bill will probably come back in some form or another, some regulation for um, athletic trainers. Again, we're not opposed, per se, to some regulation for athletic trainers. We just want to make sure that whatever it is is in line with education um, and training. And um, previous attempts haven't really, haven't really shown that, and so we're hoping um, that it's next year it will be something that we can um, that we can work with. And then um, the other thing that we're looking at, um, and you know, nothing has been decided, but the issue, and I don't know if it's um, how where you are, maybe you are, um, of third party payers, um, especially in the area of workers comp. Um, there, there are um, third party entities who come in and work with um, work with the payers and um, provide provide discounts to the payers um, at the expense of the physical therapists um, who are providing those services. Um, that's something with, that we've been looking at in California over the past few years. We've worked with other organizations. We're trying to build a coalition to see if um, we can work with other organizations to try to resolve this issue. But we are looking at it again in um, 2019 and, and trying to put t together some strategies to address that. So you may be hearing a little bit more about that um, over the next year. And um, I think that's all I have to report for now. Are there any questions? Yes, can you give me an example of an NPA? Um, not, not exactly. I mean, there, they are agencies that are working with children. Um, they're set up as private agencies and um, they contract with, um, with BTs to provide those services. So they may work with the school. They're not a public school and they're not a public agency, they're private. I gotcha, mm -hmm. okay, that makes sense. Um, I do have another question. We had a um, great presentation in September regarding dry needling. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if CPT had any comment um, regarding that. We don't have any comment right now. It's, um, it's an issue that we are watching um, very closely. It's not um, something, um, there hasn't been a huge groundswell um, in California um, with our members as of yet, but we know that um, it's something that is drawing a lot of interest across the country. So it is um, on the stove. It's not, it's not on the front burner right now. It's on the back burner. Um, we did. Um, 
the same individuals who came and presented to the PT board um, did come and present also to our Government Affairs Committee um, in October. So we're very aware of the issue and again something that we're that we're watching. But um, we don't anticipate any immediate action. Um, at least not in, not in 2019. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Foe? Public comment. Thank you. Um, We can jump into agenda item 12 unless someone needs a break. Are you doing okay? Or? Uh, yeah, I just asked for public comment. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, so let's jump into agenda item number 12, which is our ledge report. All right, so September 20th was the last day for the governor to sign our veto bills in his possession. Um, all statutes will take effect January 1st, 2019. I'll go ahead and um, direct members to the legislative summary and I'll go through each bill and provide a brief um, update. Legislative summary is on page 56. Uh, the first bill, AB 2078, Sex Offenses, Professional Services, was held under submission on August 16th in the Senate Appropriations Committee. The next bill on um, the ledge summary is EB 2138, Licensing Board's Denial of Application, Criminal Conviction, uh, which the board did take an opposed position on, and that bill unfortunately was chaptered on September 30th. Um, one of the last Senate amendments was to have a delayed Im implementation date of January 1st, uh, 2020, which gives the board um, time to pursue rulemaking. So um, you'll see um, a few of those items on our rulemaking calendar, our proposed 2019 uh, rulemaking calendar. The next bill on the legislative summary is AB 2221, the um, Occupational Therapy Practice Act, and that was chaptered on September 18th. The next bill is EB 2423, Physical Therapists, Direct Access to Services. As Ms. Defoe um, mentioned, this, uh, board which, this uh, bill, which the board did take a support position on, um, was chaptered on September 26th. Um, AB 2958, State Bodies, Meetings, Teleconference. Um, this bill was chaptered on September 28th. And AB 3110, Athletic Trainers, uh, which the board took an oppose and less admitted position on, was held under submission in the Senate Appropriations Committee on September 16th. And the last bill on the legislative summary, SB 1448, Healing Arts Licenses Probation Status Disclosure, was chaptered on September 19th. <coughs> Did you mean August 16th for AB 3110 or September? Yeah. Oh, did I say September? My, my yeah. apologies. It, I meant August. <laughs> Mr. Kaiser, is there anything you want to bring to our attention? Um, no, not for the legislative. Um, anything we need to know about AB 2138 other than what Brooke said? Um, 2138 will discuss um, an proposal of a new regulatory calendar moving forward. Thank you. There will have to be some um, consideration given to regulations that come as a result of that legislation. Okay, thank you. Any board comment on the ledge report? Any public comment on the ledge report? Thank you, Brooke. We can move to um, yeah, agenda item 13, rulemaking report. Okay, so on page 63 of the meeting materials is the rulemaking tracking form, which lists all the rulemaking items from the 2018 rulemaking calendar, which was adopted at the November 2017 meeting. The first item on the tracking form is the coursework tool. 
Uh, staff are finalizing the initial rulemaking package, which will be sent over to DCA Legal for their review soon. The second item on the tracking form is the setting an examination score for the National Physical Therapy Examination. The board adopted modified language at the September 2018 board meeting and directed PTP staff to initiate the rulemaking process. And staff are in the process of preparing the initial rulemaking package uh, for submission to DCA Legal for their review. If we um, go up to the one before the coursework tool, mm -hmm. are those dates correct? Am I looking at 11, 15, 17, and then 5, 27, 17? Yeah, they are. Okay. Yes, they are yeah, correct. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. And that first date is when it's initially placed on the rulemaking calendar. Okay, thank you. Okay, and the third item on the rulemaking tracking form is the disciplinary guidelines. Uh, with the passage of AB 2138, the disciplinary guidelines will need to be placed on hold as we identify the impact of AB 2138 on the guidelines and the rulemaking package. Um, so we've also, and again, as um, Mr. Kaiser said, we have um, accounted for this increase in rulemaking for the proposed 2019 rulemaking calendar, which will be discussed under agenda item 14. Okay, and the next item, um, proposed language for the clinical service requirement for foreign educated applicants was presented and adopted at the September 2018 meeting. Um, the board directed staff to initiate the formal rulemaking process. Um, we are working on the initial rulemaking package for submission to DCA Legal for their review. And all other items on the rulemaking tracking form are still being researched by staff and are included in the 2019 proposed calendar. Any questions or comments from board members regarding the rulemaking report? Anything you need to point out to us, Mr. Kaiser? Um, well, you'll see how what we uh, had projected to try to take on in that year, mm -hmm. uh, a good portion of it, we have the meat done, right? Now we're going to move through the actual official process of approval. Um, the two that no progress was made on and continuing competency in both the retired license status. Um, the retired license status is understandable in the sense that we you know, had recent mm -hmm. legislation that was enacted, we kind of want to let that play out a little bit and iron out our existing processes and try to figure out what works, all while trying to calculate how that gets implemented within our technology base and breeze. Um, so I would recommend those two be moved on when we discuss um, next year's rulemaking calendar. Um, the model guidelines, uh, it pains me to say that we have to pause, but given where we are in that process and the gravity that 2138 has and the things that we're um, going to be addressing as a result of 2138, there's a good possibility that we can, if we moved forward with the existing package, we would be starting a secondary package to affect the guidelines before the first package finished. So um, we're going to continue to kind of keep an eye on that and look at it, um, but there will be some changes that will affect the, the guidelines as a result of 2138. So it's just better to kind of pause, keep that work that we've done, and then also make those edits for 2138 before we allow it to move forward. Okay. Any other pub, uh, board comment? And any public comment? Okay. Looks like we're doing okay with that item. Um, agenda item 14 ties right in. Discussion possible board action on 2019 rule making calendar. So in this um, agenda item, what we're doing is basically creating a list of what we anticipate are going to be um, potential regulations required next year. Um, we'll send that list to the Office of Administrative Law. It helps them to kind of um, estimate the workload that they're going to be dealing with next year. Um, and so my recommendation would be to take the two um, that we had 
with continuing competency and with the retired license status, continue those on into the next calendar year. Um, also, including the packages that are um, in process now because they'll be moving on to OAL next year. Um, but here is where I think the 2138 discussion, um, at least at this early stages, we need to consider um, placeholders, if you will, for OAL to kind of look at to determine workload in that 2138 is going to have to have boards at least um, consider changes to language in a couple different categories. Um, and we could list them out that way and just try to do it as general as possible at this point. Um, but the, our California Code of Regulations has our uh, substantially related criteria, and there is a potential that that would need to be edited as a result of 2138. Um, so that's potentially one regulatory package in and of itself. Uh, along with that are the uh, criteria for rehabilitation, in which we have existing in CCR, but again, 2138 might, um, we might see a need to at least edit that CCR as a result of 2138. So I would recommend putting those two um, as regulatory placeholders for OAL for the next year's regulatory calendar. So you need action on that. I do. But also open to any questions that the board may have as far as changes to the calendar or recommendations for um, future plans and regulation. Board comment? Public comment for rulemaking calendar in 2019. So, Jason, if you don't mind, will you tease those two out again for us? Um, sure, absolutely. In, in our current regulation now, we have a, a regulation that is um, substantially related criteria for criminal convictions. Um, it is fairly, it's a fairly simple regulation. Um, and I understand that it's probably very hard or difficult for the board to conceptualize at this point because there's so little known about the impact that 2138 is going to have. Um, boards and bureaus at DCA are convening um, and you know trying to have a meeting of the minds to kind of determine what would be best practice moving forward, how to go about it, and also how to keep um, each board's individuality in mind as well. So. Not that we have this available to you today as a recommendation, but um, we might theoretically look at our, our regulation for substantial relation and say, you know, here are a few lines that we think should be added to it to account for the, 2030, the 2138 legislation. Um, and that same explanation kind of goes along with the um, criteria for rehabilitation. So um, 2138 has made changes in what the board could consider for applicants when it comes to criteria for rehabilitation. And right now it's still unknown um, that, that what edits need to be required or would be required as a result of the 2138 considering our existing CCR for um, rehabilitation criteria. I have a question for you, Jason. Now that 2138 has passed, will licensees be held to a different standard than applicants when it comes to criminal offenses? Arguably, yes. Um, the requirement for a licensee is not changing, but the requirement for disclosure in the application process will. Um, so effective January 1, 2020, the board will no longer be able to ask applicants about their criminal history on their application. Um, what we will be doing is through the, the DOJ and FBI criminal background check, um, when there is a hit for an applicant, the board will then um, pursue on its own the records or the documents pertaining to that, out, that conviction. So um, whether it's certified copies from an arresting agency or a um, court jurisdiction, 
um, the board and its staff will now be responsible for obtaining that. We will not be able to ask um, the applicant to participate in that process and get those records for us. Um, and one of the unknowns is we will be able to ask the applicant if they have any mitigation that they'd like us to consider in their application because they may have a certificate of rehabilitation as a result of that conviction. But it's questionable at this point as to how you go about doing that without asking them if they have a conviction in the first mm -hmm. place. Right. right. So there's, there's kind of a um, chicken and egg equation that's happening here that we don't have solid answers for just yet. But that's one of those things that I think we need to consider um, in those two categories in regulation where edits might, uh, edits might be, um, become necessary as a result of that conversation. But to answer your question directly, licensees would still be obligated to answer on their renewal forms that yes, they have been or no, they haven't been convicted of a crime or action since their last renewal. So there's a bit of a, a different standard there between applicants and licensees as a result. What implications will that have to our budget now that our staff has to do some more investigation than having those documents provided to them upon application? That, that's something that we're still really having, in some ways you could see efficiencies that result from it because what you don't know you can't act upon, right? And so there are circumstances where applicants revealed to us a conviction that they received that we would not have been made aware of through the through the background process. Um, a good example of that would be um, maybe a petty theft conviction in another jurisdiction that wasn't reported to FBI, and so there is no fingerprint <clears throat> basis for us to be involved in. That will no longer take the board's resources because we will not be aware of it. We will not have been able to ask the applicant about it. They will not have been obligated to disclose it to us, and without starting that process, we won't know. And so there's some efficiencies that you can realize there. At the same time, the records that we now have to pursue, where we have to reach out to the jurisdictions, to the, the courts, and to the arresting agencies to pursue those documents, might eat that time up. And so without doing it yet, it's kind of hard to anticipate you know, which one's greater. So there's a, there's a, a potential that this could create uh, the same amount of work. It could be less or it could be more. It's hard to tell at this point. Okay. You mentioned possibly missing, you know, a petty theft in another state. Is there to a potential to miss something bigger? Absolutely. Um, two things to consider, though. Even if that petty theft was in the state of California, if it was um, within the last, the way 2138 is written, if it was within the last seven years, but it's not on the list of significant crimes in the penal code, it's not something we would be able to consider anyway. And if it's older than seven years, we wouldn't be able to either. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a consistency issue there. The other consistency issue arises from what we can rely on other jurisdictions reporting to the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Mm -hmm. So the criminal background checks that occur in other jurisdictions vary with no rhyme or reason, right? The, the estimates are that the Federal Bureau of Investigation has about um, 30 to 40 percent of all known arrests in the United States. Well, that's not a very reliable number at mm -hmm. that point. Um, and every jurisdiction reports differently or not at all or completely. I mean, a lot of it has to do with a, a particular county's ability in, in, in technology and in finance to be able to provide that information to the FBI. Um, one of the other things to, you know, for the department to be considering in the future is moving from a one-time uh, background check through FBI to the same system that we have in DOJ, which is more of a wrap back, mm -hmm. that any time that something is reported to the FBI for one of our licensees, we would be made aware of it. Um, given the, the spirit and the nature of 2138, I don't know that that argument is going to go very far in the future. It's something that we were looking at as a whole of the department, but this might stifle that talk a little bit. Is it, is it fair to ask you to give us a worst case scenario of something that could happen because of this bill? 
Um, I think it's fair. I don't know that I could give you a worst <laughs> case. I can, ex you know, I can express to you some of the same um, concerns that I had and expressed to the authors of the bill. Yes. In that, anecdotally speaking, we can see that even when a, an educational program lowers its um, admittance rates and its standards of admittance, that we see a, a correlation in discipline on the other side through licensure. So when um, we had an abundance of certain programs come on that have a lower standard of admittance, we actually see the complaint intake increase and can draw a correlation to that particular program. So saying, you know, applying that to now licensure standards, um, I think it's fair to say that enforcement very well will be affected by that. Mm -hmm. Any other board discussion regarding 2138 or any of the other um, items Jason talked about for the 2019 rulemaking calendar? I think it was just that item, really, 2138, the placeholder. Unless there's other, unless there's other regulations that the board wants to consider um, addressing in 2019. This is the biggie. This will take quite a bit of time. Yeah. Any public comment? That was good public comment. <laughs> right on cue. <laughs> so you need a motion. Well, does anyone want to make a motion? Just to clarify, because on page 71, Schedule A proposed regulations is blank at this point. So the intent would be for the board, or the re ask would be for the board to identify, for example, 2138 as the item yeah. to develop proposed language related to that item. Um, and for the purposes of this, we could be a little bit more specific and we could, you know, specify out those two, whether it's substantially related or the rehabilitation criteria, but I'd also like to carry over the retired status and the continued competency as well. And so following on pages mm -hmm. 72 <coughs> through 75 mm -hmm. are all items that are carry over, Current. right? Mm -hmm. So do you wanna, do you wanna take it as separate items, or do you want to take it as all one? Because I'm happy to propose that we adopt Schedule B mm -hmm. um, right now, okay. and then we can work on Schedule A. I think that's a good way to go about doing it. I'd, I'd like to get a general consensus on carryover. I mean, we have you know four that are already a good, a, at least an investment into the process at this point that I don't want to lose. Um, Okay. So I will propose uh, that we um, that the board continue to work on the items listed in Schedule B, uh, starting on page 72 for rulemaking. Second that. A motion by Dr. Drummond, a second by Mr. Watkins. Any further board discussion or public comment? And so we would we would then be able to uh, amend that by striking if there are any that we don't want to keep. Correct. Okay. So um, I would suggest maybe going through them line by uh, item by item just to see a straw poll if we want to keep them or, or delete them and then we can, if that's desired, then we can, um, we can strike those items line by line. Strike or accept either way. Well, because I mean, we have the entire the entirety as an accept, but if there's something that we want to strike out and not follow it, then we would just do that. Okay. And, the, and then the, the rest of it remains. Brooke, would you like to call them out from Schedule B, starting on um, agenda, um, let's see, agenda book page 72? Sure. Okay, so the first um, item is the satisfactory documentary evidence of equivalent degree for licensure as a PT or PTA coursework tool. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so if anyone has an objection to having any of these items in, if you could just speak up as she reads them off. Um, I'm wondering if maybe we can get a, a number between one and 10 of importance. Um, just so we can get an idea, a rank. Uh, and I don't want to necessarily rank them like in prioritize. Pri I want to to prioritize. I would want to just say how important is it? Is it is it a ten? Yes, we it's important, or is it a one? Low importance. There's no relation between any of them. Yes. Okay. Excellent. I can do that. So. Um, I'll probably start with the model guidelines probably being the most important. Um, second to that. So you are going to rank them, okay? Well, that one's um, because of its consumer protection impact, it's the highest of priority at that point. Um, and then considering investment and work into some of the other packages, or even the simplicity or the complexity of a package, as an example, um, the pass point for the MPTE and adopting that. Um, it's fairly simple, I think, from this point moving forward. Um, and because it's a, of its simplicity, I think it rises in priority just so we can get it done. Um, the the satisfactory documentary evidence. Um, the system is existing. Uh, we would like to see some changes into it to create some kind of efficiencies um, for non-accredited graduates. Um, but it's uh, akin to um, even the clinical service requirements. There are existing systems in place um, and they seem to work uh, fairly well, and so they're not as high on the priority as something like the model guidelines. Um, continuing competency, I think, is something that, without having the staff here and the benefit of argument from them, um, they would like to address some quirks in the language in the continuing competency regulations, so I'll speak on their behalf and say that they consider it to be a very high priority. Um, the retirement status, again, it's one of those things where we have an existing system in place, uh, but that statute is going to um, sunset in the, in the near future, so having a regulation to work off of in its place would be nice to have. Um, without it, we would, be, we would just be bound to the existing statutes and the general provisions, um, so we wouldn't have specified fees, as an example, moving in and out of um, retired status, and we wouldn't be able to impose those until after that regulation was promulgated. Um, so we'd be eating that work for a little while. So that's a pretty high priority, too. On that same list, you will see um, the three regulatory packages that I had mentioned before, though, in substantial relationship, and then the two rehabilitation criteria. Um, so those are already included under Schedule B? They're already there. And those, I think, you'll find, I can't make an estimate as far as how important or how soon at this point, because that's something that's going to be affected um, department-wide. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other, the other variable to kind of consider is how effective the regulation is right now. Um, the, the advantage that we have here over maybe some of the other boards or bureaus is that we actually have these regulations already. And so already specifying what um, substantial relationship is in regulation is a kind of a head start um, compared to some of the situations of other boards, but um, we'd still have to consider whether or not edits need to be made to the existing regulation. Um, if I may, um, the department has identified these packages um, as critical and important um, and to be a priority. I have a concern about 
the timelines identified here on page 74, which says to OAL for review by June of 2020, um, whereas the law becomes effective, I believe, earlier that year, in January 2020. Um, so hopefully the goal is to have these amendments done before that time. Um, and because the AB 2138 can affect so many um, regulations, these three regulations identified here and the guidelines um, and the short timeline we're working with to have it all done by January 2020, um, the department has identified that these are critical. I understand that they've started working with the programs, um, getting meeting groups together to um, recommend you know, model language um, in order to get it on track. To, to meet that January goal. So, Dr. Drummer, do you want to continue going through each one, or? Um, I believe I heard one <laughs> item that you kind of indicated was could be something that could wait. And off the top of my head I don't require I don't re recall which one that was now. Yeah. Because I, you went through all of them and, and they all ended up rising yeah, I don't, to in a level of import. <laughs> yeah, I don't really like the idea of saying that any of them can wait. I understand. <laughs> but if I was going to have to choose and and taking counsel's um, comments uh, into consideration retired status and um, the clinical service requirement affecting the coursework tool would be the two that I think will, by the nature of priority, kind of fall by the wayside, if anything falls by the wayside. Okay. Um, the, the projections to OAL for review, um, these dates are um, post effect date for the law of 2138. Um, and then having said that, they're also conservative estimates given the review process at this point. So it's going to be difficult to um, state anything else really. I, I'm not sure that, you, well you can't have regulations really take effect before statutes take effect anyway. But having them kind of hit at the very same time is going to be a very difficult thing to do, given two things. One, just the nature of the process, but how soon this is coming. Uh, I, I'm, for, I'm thankful and fortunate that we have these regulations at all, because given what I've seen about model language being proposed, we're about two-thirds of the way there. Mm -hmm. So whether or not those actually need to be changed are really the consideration. So, would you really want us to to uh, remove items from the list, or would it be better to allow to allow you the authority to be able to prioritize according to what we have ca capacity for um, with staff, well, et cetera? Well, keep in mind for the purposes this list is for the purposes of what we would send to OAL is a projection of potential work, mm -hmm. okay. um, and if you use this year as a, a, an idea. We told them six, and we only started four. Right. All right. Um, that that concept has changed a couple times throughout the years, where we would tell them any any plan we might have under the sky, and we'd have this long list, and we'd have one or two done. Right. Um, and then we've also told them one or two that we knew we were going to have done, but we managed to get three or four. So it's it's just kind of a heads up list for OAL to be able to work off of anyway. Okay. Um, well, in that case, I would just, I would rather not go through them line by line then and just um, allow the motion to be to adopt um, Schedule B at this time, and then we can move to Schedule A and determine what those will be. And, and I appreciate that. I think staff's recommendation would be to leave Schedule B the way it is. Um, we'll work through what the, you know, what workload allows for it. Schedule A is anything else that you think the board might want to um, take on in regulation for next year. 
any additions. Any other board comment regarding Schedule B? For public comment regarding Schedule B? Any board member have a motion? Oh. We made it earlier. Sorry. Oh, yes. And TJ seconded it. Exactly. Same motion. The motion to adopt Schedule B. Okay, hearing no further discussion or comments from the public, we'll have a roll call vote. Alicia Benny Amen. Aye. TJ Watkins. Aye. Jesus Dominguez. Aye. Daniel Drummer. Aye. Katarina Elby. Aye. Tanya McMillian. Aye. Motion carries six to zero. Okay, and we're coming up to um, agenda item number 15, public comment for any items that are not on the agenda. You don't want to address Schedule A? Oh, do we need to address? I'm sorry I, I, about that. I'd yeah. like the board to have the opportunity to add to any um, workload for regulation that you'd like um, for any promulgation. Is there anything that um, we should be adding to the list for 2019, considering what Schedule B has on it now. Uh -oh. Well, did you? I'm assuming you wanted us to add something addressing 2138. So those to be those, able to initiate that. Those three that are um, listed on B now, on Schedule B now, for a substantial relation mm -hmm. and uh, rehabilitative criteria, are the are the crux of that. Um, it may be a smart strategy to, to add something on there that's a little bit looser and just tied to 2138, but between the guidelines and those three um, regulations, I think we cover it. Is there anything else um, outside of what we've already listed, whether it's continuing competency or the retired status, um, the pass point, the coursework tool, uh, or the clinical standards? Is there anything else that we want to try and look at. Mr. Watkins, Ms. McMillan? No? Dr. Drummer, Dr. Dominguez, Ms. Elby? The public? Staff? Staff will reserve their comments until after the board. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like there won't be any recommendations to add. Well, I'm going to ask the executive officer because he hinted at yeah. the idea of a perhaps more ambiguously worded rulemaking piece that would take in some of the concepts of 2138, um, or if not that in particular. Strategically speaking, I, you know, it's an idea. I think that. Um, it's covered under the existing four that we have on Schedule B now. Um, the other thing about this calendar is that it doesn't um, hold us to an expectation that there are things that come up, um, other issues that we might um, be forced to deal with as a result of unforeseen circumstances, whether they be legislative or not, we'd always be able to. And so 2138 wouldn't be a concern at that point. Okay. One recommendation. Um also impacted by AB 2138 is the board's application. So you'd mentioned earlier, for example, that for applications, you can't request conviction mm -hmm. information anymore. So that's something that might have to be addressed in reg. Mm -hmm. Would that be covered under what we already have or would that be a separate item? No, that item? would be a separate item. Yeah. Um, the board's applications aren't currently incorporated by reference. Um, Council makes a good point. I guess I would probably look at um, implementation first and then promulgate a <coughs> regulation based on that implementation. Um, but like any other situation with regulation, there is some risk involved in that, but it's no more than the risk that we experience today and that while we require an applicant to apply <coughs> using our application, um, because it's not incorporated by reference in the regulation, it's a bit of a courtesy form. They could provide us that same data on a banana peel if they wanted to, <laughs> or a bar. So. 
Duly no duly noted. <laughs> Okay, going once, going twice. Any other comments regarding Schedule A or ideas for Schedule A? Sounds good. Hearing yeah. none, the board would, staff would like to thank the board for not adding. <laughs> <laughs> That's your comment. <laughs> There's always March. <laughs> All right, so now we can move to agenda item 15. Is there any public comment for items not on the agenda? Nothing burning in your heart, Florence? <laughs> okay, so it looks like the only other thing for today would be a closed session item um, to consider the evaluation of the performance for executive officer. So we will um, go into closed session and then open after we finish just to Recess for the afternoon and then reconvene tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. And I might as well say now that we will be in this room, room 201. It's posted that we'll be in room um, 112, but we will have someone at that door with signage there all day directing public and anyone else up to this room. We've been allowed to stay here for tomorrow. So um, tomorrow's meeting for Thursday, December 6th, will be in room 201. All right, we have a little break before we go into closed session? Okay.